All right, everybody, welcome back to another episode of GDIY presented by Standing Stone Supply. This is kind of a milestone episode here for two reasons. First, we have our first uh, check-in with Jen Broom from Quinnebog Kennels. I know she's been requested a number of times throughout the years, but she's also joining us for the number 200 episode of GDIY. So, uh, Jen, welcome to the show and uh, glad to finally have you on and get to know you a little bit better. Nick, thank you so much for having me on. I'm honored to be here. I've uh, listened to many of your podcasts as I've trekked across the country to my uh, training events and competitions and hunting. So I'm uh, thank you for inviting me. Absolutely. Well, that means a lot to me. And, and I'm excited to jump in. Uh, something that's really kind of popped up here recently, more or less, in the gun dog world is you're you're starting to hear a lot about you can kind of call it what you want. We're going to get into it a little bit. You know, the obstacle course, the O course, agility, confidence. There's a b whole bunch of names for it, and we're going to do a deep dive on it here today. But first, I want you to kind of introduce yourself to the listeners for those who may not know who you are and how many different pots you have your hands in, because you kind of, you wear a lot of hats and dance around a lot of different things. So kind of summarize that up for everybody the best you can. Great. Thank you so much. Um, I think I, I've got a great story that I'm very fortunate to, uh, to, to, uh, talk about. I grew up in the coastal community of New Jersey on the Barnegat Bay, the, the famous waterfowl Barnegat Bay. And I did grow up, um, uh, hunting. My dad was a, a great mentor for me. Uh, from the time I was about eight years of age, he, uh, he started taking me out hunting. At first, we would just be plinking 22s and, and learning about gun safety, um, but then it went on to um, goose hunting in, in the eastern shores of Maryland, where I spent between the ages of eight and a, and a teenager having the beautiful opportunity to hunt there, and I've hunted waterfowl and, and brant on the Barnegat Bay, um, also spent my youth competitive sailing along the Barnegat Bay. Nice. Um, Fabulous, fabulous way to grow up. My uh, my first vehicle as a youngster, really, as a 10-year-old, was a Boston Whaler that I zipped all around the river on. <laughs> my friends all lived there. If I didn't uh, tie my boat up properly, my dad would just come and take it. <laughs> so <laughs> I learned I learned how I learned a lot of independence and responsibility as a youngster, which I'm so grateful for because now in my in my fifties here, I just jump in my dog truck and take that across the country pretty independently too. Um, I uh, went to school um, at the University of Rhode Island for wildlife biology and management. And I dabbled around with some state positions uh, and federal positions, uh, US Fish and Wildlife. Um, got involved with Ducks Limited up in New England. My my dad, um, was very heavily involved in Ducks Unlimited. So I was like the DU little girl. I was carrying the pitchers around. We would get even puppies back then. And I mean, for my whole childhood, uh, Ducks Unlimited was a huge part of my upbringing and influence. So when I went to school, I joined right in with Ducks Unlimited people. Um, I went to their events. I, I pulled traps at their tournaments. Um, was involved in shooting, so really stayed in that whole world and and was really into all aspects of hunting, turkey hunting, deer hunting, waterfowl hunting. Um, in my early 20s, now go back a little bit, always loved dogs, grew up with standard poodles. We took them <laughs> hunting. I was, I was about to say, did you actually yeah. use them for retrieving? Uh-huh, we did, because I, yeah, uh, my, my, we didn't, my parents didn't want a lab. And so I'd actually borrow friends, Labrador retrievers, legit neighbors. They would let me borrow their labs and I would take them also on, on hunting trips. <laughs> nice. But the, the poodles did, did hunt with us. Not as certainly as an intense as a Labrador, but they were amazing creatures. I learned so much, but I was that neighbor. I was the little kid who was the entrepreneur. I cleaned boats for people. I house sat, I babysat. I, I walked dogs. I had a dog walking business. Um, I mean, as a kid. Uh, paper route, lawn mowing, you name it. Like I just, I love to make money and play and make money and play. And Indicative think, of what would come in the future. <laughs> I know, a, a beautiful precursor. <laughs> so uh, in my early 20s, um, while working seasonally as a biologist, um, uh, I, I got involved with Labrador Retrievers and just working them for hunting personally. And uh, 
a local gentleman who had a really neat farm, who was a pretty high level businessman, uh, saw me training, sent his manager out and said, you know, you need to come see my kennels. You need to come see my dogs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the guy, I swear, he pursued me for about a year. And I finally went, I drove the 20 minutes to his kennels and he had to pick my jaw up off the ground because what I saw were, it was a kennel environment with these Labrador retrievers living in better conditions than I did as a, as a poor <laughs> sort of college student. Uh, they had um, they had ponds in their airing yards. They had automatic water sprays. They had, I mean, it was the most beautiful kennel environment that I've ever seen, which again, probably is a little indicative of the kennel environment that I've created with Quinnabog Kennels because I'm yeah. all about being it, you know, aesthetically beautiful and, and just, I love the dogs to really live in an upbeat and beautiful and clean, healthy, happy environment. So, man, that was the start of my dog training career. And that was in my early 20s. And, uh, and you know, here, here we are today. Um, back in 2000, I purchased my first piece of land here in Connecticut and uh, went for a small business loan and, uh, and, and got a loan to build my first kennel facility. And as a 2500 foot kennel facility that pretty much as soon as it opened we um we outgrew and, <laughs> immediately and, and it was fabulous um i uh i really started training retrievers that that was my wheelhouse and i was training retrievers specifically as hunting dogs for people for upland and waterfowl hunting i was pretty heavily into guiding um i was guiding at some of the local preserves particularly Addyville East Farm in Rhode Island and then go out to Millbrook, um, New York area, Dutchess County, and got to guide on some of the awesome um, preserves out there, the, the private areas, which I totally loved, and met amazing clients. And what was really, really beautiful back then, and again, this is like early 2000, the customers would come to me when they were interested in getting a dog, and I'd help them even find the right puppy. Nice. And Life is so different today because now people will bring me their next future, hopefully rock star gun dog that they might have gotten from a pet store. Yeah, I was going to say off Craigslist for a backyard ads. breeder. Yeah, and so so life has changed a lot, and we've had to make a lot of adjustments constantly to our training program. Um, in 2015, I built another facility right here on the property that's called the Lodge. And that's 6,500 square foot. So we have upwards of a hundred dog capacity at our rocking and rolling highest times. We could have that. And oh Lord, that's a lot of dogs. <laughs> it's a lot of dogs. It takes a team of about 25 people. Um, so it's been a, it's been a beautiful, beautiful progression. Um, on the personal side, I particularly have Labrador retrievers, uh, German short hairs, and I just got my first Cocker Spaniel. My, my own, which Jordan Horak, who's on your uh, podcast also, yep. it's out of his stud dog, Grizz. And um, her name is Betty Cocker. And <laughs> I have uh, I have aspirations of field trialing her. And um, so, yeah, I've I've um, I'm really into constantly improving myself as a trainer. I work with beautiful mentors and peers as much as I can. I compete with my dogs um, to prove their pedigrees and to push and challenge myself as a trainer. Um, and from showing my German short hairs in the show ring to field trialing horseback to my retrievers field trialing, NAVDA, invitational, um, I love to learn and dabble in all of it. Yeah, it, and it, you're, you're just speaking to my heart right now because that's <laughs> that's me too. It's, a, it's almost like I, I love to dabble in so much that I don't really become proficient in any one thing. Yeah. And it's something I'm trying to do better is kind of focus on one thing at a time before yeah. dabbling in other stuff. But there's just so much cool stuff out there and so much knowledge to have and people with so much experience. It is hard not to kind of just dance around and jump all over the place sometimes. Yeah. As far as my hunting background, you know, growing up with the waterfowl aspect, um, I, in my 20s, I had the opportunity to work with great hunters. And I, my first buck, my first deer I shot was an eight point buck. And I, I actually second, got him right in the throat with a muzzleloader because in Rhode Island, you could either hunt with a shotgun or a muzzleloader. You couldn't hunt rifle. Okay. So I, I deer hunted um, in Rhode Island. I turkey hunted. Um, but it's interesting when I got into my 30s, 
I became so obsessed with upland hunting. Um, in my mid mid to late twenties, I was introduced to grouse and woodcock hunting, and yeah. I was hook, <laughs> line, and sinker. Um, I'll I'll maybe go waterfowl hunting. I'll I'll go jump shoot, and I'm excited to go when I hunt the prairies and stuff. But if you say you do you want to go sit in a duck blind, or do you want to go walk fifteen miles in, behind your dogs and pursue gate pursue upland? It just so sings to my soul. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. It, it, yeah. I can mirror that exactly. Yeah. I mean, the same exact sentiment. Duck hunting kind of got me into the dog space in, yeah. a, in a way. Hounds first, then duck hunting. Yeah. But when, once you go see your first rough grouse shoot through the oh. woods. Or, oh, my goodness. Or you land your first woodcock o- over your dog's point. It's just like, you know what? I, I'm not, I'm not going to say I'll never go back in the duck blind again. But uh, my first choice is always going to be putting on the the boots and going for a walk with the dog. Yeah, it's uh, it, to get the dog to get to see the dogs work in that environment and out there questing for birds, and it's just so beautiful. And all your training has come together. Not taking away from waterfowl hunting because again, I love that. But often the dog is sitting there quivering and so excited, and you know, depending on the action, it could be really crazy and you got a freezing cold dog an excited dog or a dog that's you're not seeing anything upland is just it's even a great day if all you do is go for a walk Mm -hmm. across the prairie with your gun and your dog it's a great day yeah so i mean with with you really kind of focusing on your labs and retrievers at the start of all this and trialing uh were you were you doing the upland hunting with your labs initially or did you go ahead and branch out into pointing dogs at that that time as well it's funny. I recall, um, so I started with waterfowl hunting with my labs and going into some hunt tests. And when I, I remember the first time I took my lab to Montana, my, the first maybe hour of the walk, all she was doing was like staring at me, walking with me, staring it with me because she never upland hunted and she never quested before. And there was another dog there and she all of a sudden saw a bird out there and started her, you could see her light bulb came on and her uh-huh. learning curve on that trip was amazing. So um, I started with definitely with the retrieving and, and the, the waterfowl work, the marking and stuff, and then went on to the upland work. Um, gotcha. And about, I'm not sure even how long ago it was, 2006, I think I got, 2005, I got my first German short hair. And then I've been hooked and I've, I've had five, I've got five three right now. Yeah. 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 When, once you get those pointing dogs, they tend to stay in the stable, but you can also say the same thing for your labs and retrievers, you know, anybody, oh, yeah. it, it's, you know, you want to talk about a, a true versatile dog. I mean, that the lab is it. They just don't point, right. You know, you want to yeah. talk about the dog that you can just pick up and go do anything with That's They're that's such probably a versatile it. dog. Yeah, they really yeah. are. I mean, a short hair is as well. A short hair is an amazingly versatile dog. Um, as are the other versatile dogs. Um, but a Labrador retriever, I mean, I own three of them. Um, they still are probably one of my favorite universal, easiest to live with. (laughs) Um, they're just a a beautiful creature. So far, how's the cocker stack up to the labs in terms Uh, of flushing and working with you and living with you? Well, she's not even quite six months. I call her a a hummingbird on crack. Uh, (laughs) she's like, my husband and I, Jason, we were joking last night, just trying to hang, hang out with her. Um, I'm like, okay, I'm going to hold her head and her body still, and you hold her tail still. And because she just beautifully reverberates. Um, she's not even six months old. Um, she's a busy Betty. Um, so I haven't really pushed her. I've only had her chase birds a couple times because she loves them. So she doesn't need to learn bad habits. Yeah. And we're now getting sort of more serious about our hold and carry and our fetch work and our steadiness work. But she's my husband Jason made the comment again he says there is so much brain in that little head she is so smart and so sensitive um a rabbit could run in front of her and if you holler Betty no she stops in her tracks and comes right to you whereas Mm -hmm. my seven and a half year old German short hair will kind of flip you off as she's listening (laughs) to you scream no to say I'll 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 come to you right after I catch it um I yeah, just, just, just in a minute, mom. In yeah, a minute. <laughs> almost. Um, there's just a beautiful element of sensitivity there. And it really, as a trainer, makes me switch gears from training the lab to the short hair to the cocker 
and it's not breed specific, it's personality specific, knowing and understanding um, you can't push her. You can't push her hard. You don't need to be um, intent. This is serious. I had a beautiful talk with her breeder um, the other day uh, who works closely with, with Jordan Horak. Um, his name is Davis Brewerton. And he was saying that he really doesn't even e-collar condition his cockers. And I saw that. I watched the the dams and the grandmother of, of my dog and they're awesome. And, and all you had to do is raise your voice a little bit. So I'm going to learn a lot from this dog because I don't want to mess her up. I'd love to field trial her. And I do, I want to be careful not to put as control into her as I would normally put into a Labrador retriever or German short hair, because what's really important as I'm learning for their trials is a really hardcore flush. Mm -hmm. And if you put any uh, concern or worry into that flush, I could get a, a hiccup of a flush or a point or, you know, so she's going to be a beautiful learning opportunity for me. Gotcha. Well, you'll have to keep me updated on that, especially when kind of comparing and contrasting styles with labs and sure. stuff like that. Cause I'm kind of a, on a, a, on a flushing dog kick on my sure. behind the scenes, but uh, let's, let's go ahead and start veering into the, uh, the O course. And, and I am a fan of before we even get into how, or even the why first you have to kind of define it. And that starts with the terminology. And and I know with this, as it's kind of making its way into the gun dog space, it's it's really nothing new. It's been out in the dog space overall for a while, but it's it's gaining ground and gaining popularity within the gun dog space. So let's first start off with what do we call it and why do we call it that? Great, great question. Um so I bought remnants or actually a full agility course from somebody back in 2004 when I had opened my kennel facility and we we built an arena and I saw it listed and I was like hey that would be fun to have because I was out training dogs by myself all day long and prior to that and even as a kid going back to how I trained dogs as a kid I mean it was me and my standard poodle and a hula hoop a fence I, I looked for anything and everything I could play with to challenge that dog. And I mean, I used to have her jump through hula hoops, like I'd kneel down and over my head <laughs> because it was just a definitive obstacle for her to have to navigate. So I think I, I'm, I know I bought my first agility course way back then because I was a little bit bored as a trainer of doing just yard work in a yard and walking in circles mm -hmm. and i'm so into a foundation so i said hey you know as kids were so creative kids are beautifully creative and they they'll they'll take dogs off their obstacles um let me use this agility course as a means just to add into my training if not even for the dog's education for my own variety you right. know your own sanity. I train dogs, <laughs> yeah i trained dogs by myself for so many years before i, I built up my business and the reason that the woman was selling her course, she was moving, but it was also an um, agility course that was no longer to the AKC standards of how they they changed the heights and whatever. So it was not even a, a legit at that moment agility course. Um, I've never done agility with a dog. I've never competed. I've watched it at the Labrador Retriever Specialty and Nationals. It's awesome. <laughs> but I know nothing about agility. Um, I brought the course in simply as a means for to challenge the dogs and some excitement for me. Um, we added things also that just became a little bit more exciting that I knew would challenge the dogs, such as a wobble board. Um, so many customers couldn't get their dogs in the vehicle. So we went, we went and bought a pickup truck bed and we have a pickup truck bed in our arena. Uh, we put a swinging bridge. So, it seems like every year we come up with more fun things to challenge us and the dogs with, but basically it, it came from the concept of an agility course and it's turned into exactly like what you said, a confidence. I love that term, a confidence course, because that's truly ultimately what it is um, an obstacle course, 
but I, ter- I coined the frame, it's our QK challenge course, because it challenges, ultimately, it proofs your training. It challenges your point of contact. It challenges your sends, your be stills, and your come to you off of an obstacle. Hmm. And so it, it's naturally, you know, we talk about you're, you're, you're teaching a dog something, you kind of make it easy for them to learn, and then you're progressively making it more difficult or more challenging. And so essentially this challenge course or confidence course, let's just stick with challenge course for the sake of this episode. Uh, you're, you're really just building up that dog's growth within everything that we're trying to make difficult without hitting it directly, right? You, you're, you're going on the course, you have these obstacles. So you're teaching the dog uh, these learned behaviors or, or condition responses without even doing it just over and over and over and over again in the short grass to where it becomes boring to not only the dog, but the trainer as well. You're making it fun. You're keeping their head and you're keeping their focus. Is that pretty much the the main gist of it? You know, it's so much even more than that. So let me, let me challenge you for a minute. I'm going to yeah. flip the table for a minute. Um, are you, you're, how long have you been using the course yourself with your dogs? I've been doing it for about three or four weeks now. And oh gosh. Okay. That's it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm still brand new to it, but even in that short amount of time, I'm already seeing really substantial changes within my dog's personalities just by those three or four weeks in a short period of time. Okay. And um, what do you think is what you get to hear from people? Because it is, it's like becoming this popular, definitely, which is awesome. But what do you feel that people are um, saying about the course in general of, of exactly what it does or some different elements, like some some highlighted topics? So I've heard a lot of stuff to where it's uh, it's pretty much the way I'm describing it. You kind of have your your people that are in favor of it. And then you have your detractors, your protractors and detractors. So like the people that are for it, they're talking about everything is built in with it. You know, the amount of times like you're talking about the point of contact and your cues, getting the dog used to every time you're cueing it, getting a conditioned response, you're, you're working steadiness, impulse control. You know, there, there's a few ways of, of thinking of it in that way. And then, you know, conversely, you have the people that are looking at it kind of down their nose and they're more or less looking at it in terms of how does this help me go hunt birds? Sure. Oh my gosh. I can't wait. I, you know what my goal is, is to make believers out of the non-believers. <laughs> so let's talk about the challenge course, an obstacle course or any type of agility course, but we're going to call it a challenge course. Let's forget about mentally, completely take mentally off the table what it does for a dog. Okay. Let's go with physical. Let's go with physiology. Um, I, uh, I failed to mention this in my intro, but, um, I started, uh, I've always been an equestrian I've I've had horses since my early twenties. I think I'm up to about eight horses in my lifetime. Now I've got a Tennessee walking horse for field trialing and a Nakota horse, but previous to, um, my guys now I had Arabians that I did 50 mile endurance racing on. So 50 mile races. And that means you go 50 miles straight um, on these horses. And when I gave up that sport is when I got into the the canine sports. So horses, and you can relate this to dogs, you're forever as a trainer teaching a horse that it has a hind end. And if you look at the statistics, and I wish I, I did my homework before this, it's like two thirds of a dog's weight is on their front end. I'm making this up. And the third is on their back end. Okay. And a horse, in order to really get a horse, you're you're looking for a horse to engage their rear end and step over their when they're when they're disengaging and stepping over. You're looking for them to use their hind end, their hind end, because you're building the hind end, you're building hind end awareness, you're working core strength. Okay. If you don't have that, you you get an unsound horse. Look at all the sports related injuries that happen to our dogs these days. Knees and, and ACLs and all that. Oh my goodness. And as a professional trainer, um, I got a dog in last week from a veterinarian. Great guy. Um, 10 month old puppy lab, 10 pounds overweight and didn't know how she basically had an all out meltdown trying to get her on 
the agility tabletop because it is the actual tabletop which is maybe 18 inches off the ground she flopped over on the leash played dead alligator roll because i was asking her to step up on that so um what i find is that when dogs often come to me they have no awareness of their hind end so how do you get a dog later to jump a stone wall or navigate things if they're all about their brain thinking, their heart, their desire, their energy, and pulling in the shoulders, but they have no awareness of their hind end. So forget about all the mindset portion of a challenge course. From a physiological standpoint, it teaches a dog to engage their hind end. It teaches them that they have back legs. And for those naysayers out here who are like, oh, bull crap, come hang out with me for a day with 20 dogs that arrive at my facility, 20 average dogs, they don't even know how to step up on a table. They would rather flop over and try to bite you because they don't, they'll get the front end up, but they don't understand when you ask them how to lift the back left and then the back right. Okay. Yep. So from a physiological standpoint of the challenge course, you are teaching a dog complete beautiful awareness of their hind end, their hind end engagement and working their core. And even for us humans, I did my workout this morning. How important is core strength, right? Oh, it's, it's core the strength, primary core thing. Strength. Okay. Yeah. So um, as part of my career too, I, um, I've i become beautiful friends with Dr. Janelle Appel, one of the top canine uh, sports veterinarians in the country. She's out in Montana at the nationals now. I have attended multiple retriever nationals with her, helping her treat dogs on site, helping her with, with working with these dogs. Um, and I'm a huge fan of this overall fitness with my sporting dogs because I've been through the ACL injuries with them. I've been through the iliopsoas, the groin strains. The, and so going back to this challenge course, it's an early stage to teach dogs about their full body awareness. And mm -hmm. so did that even ever like you think most people never even think about that. Right. Well, I, I noticed it with my short hair, but I uh -huh. didn't really think of it in terms of the biggest benefit of it. You know, uh -huh. it, us sporting dog guys and gun dog guys and, and more or less just hunters and, and yep. It, it's I'm I'm like all right this is teaching cooperation it's teaching cues it's teaching steadiness within it like all again all of it's built into it but I did notice especially with my short hair now she's older she's never been asked to do much of this stuff but you know she's always been one to jump on and off the tailgate and stuff like that mm -hmm. I don't I don't do that for her but I noticed it on the a-frame more specifically with her to where she has a hard time balancing her weight to where my younger dogs, my setter pup, she took to it even faster than my four or five-year-old Munsty. But my shorter, she just had a hard time with it. And I thought it was very interesting that her weight was such a challenge for her because you would think that, you know, it's just like, well, just, just, it's just a slope. It's just an incline and decline. Mm -hmm. And then to your point, the balance beam, she would not, she took forever for me to get her last back leg Yep. up on that balance beam it was always mm -hmm. one or the other she would put one on and then when she would bring mm -hmm. that fourth one up that third one shoot back down it was just like you know back and forth and so as soon as you're describing this i'm like yeah uh, i'm picturing reps with her specifically to where what you're describing took place right in front of me the dogs have been the most beautiful teachers of me of these challenge courses and i have worked thousands of dogs over this in the past 20 25 years from miniature poodles to great danes and to watch their lack of knowledge of how to put that back left foot up on something or the back right foot up on something. So it really helps with that, whatever neuron connectors from their brain to their hind ends so that they've got that self-awareness. Um, and, you know, if I get a dog, like the dog, this lab that I got last week, she literally wanted to flop over, die and come after me because she didn't understand what I was asking her to do. And I don't really believe that she knew how to use her body effectively. And he, yeah, she could jump up and down in a, in a truck or car, which is horrible for them, by the way. Okay. Yeah. Horrible for their joints. Um, but when you asked, so that was more of like, 
I'll get people whose dogs jump on the couch, jump on their king size bed and jump on the counter, but they won't step up on a platform. So mm -hmm. what is it? Is it a behavioral attitude thing? Or is it when you're asking them because they're not in that moment of excitement of doing something muscle memory, like jumping on your bed that they've done, they can't think and process through each foot. <laughs> So yeah. for me, what's so exciting about the obstacle course is it teaches body awareness, their foot awareness, um, and to the point where my short hair, who's probably one of the best on it, and I'll make some videos for you, I can get her to move like left front foot, right front foot, back right foot, up, down, backwards, and it just goes to different levels of teaching them to think, to cooperate, and to engage their body in a way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's that's really fascinating. And anybody listening to this, you know, you keep you've used the term tabletop or or uh, just stepping up onto a, a, a table. Describe the obstacles like what all is out there. You know, you talked about you're always adding something, something yeah. new, something challenging. Sure. But but describe the the basic elements of what it is that we're trying to put out there when we're designing or accruing sure. these obstacles. Is it more, you know, it can a Cato board or something as simple as that oh. have benefit out there? So. I'd love to talk about just the Cato board and we'll put that on a shelf for a minute because I've been using that with Betty Cocker. I'll just put my Cato board on my truck and I can teach, go to the platform, be steady on the platform, the recall of the platform. And then I could work on compulsion that she wants to go there so much to the point where now I work the platform as steadiness drills. Okay. There so, I mean, give me 20 things, reasons I can explain to you of how cool a platform is and the, the benefits of you get out of that. But to add for the listeners some of my more fun obstacles that we've designed, um, a swinging bridge is really fun. And we used fire hose for the bottom and slats of wood for the top. So it's a swinging bridge. Um, going to just your local uh, car place that has car parts or whatever, vehicle parts, and buying a tailgate, if you're a trainer, to have that is a fabulous tool to have. Um, we do have a ramp going up and down to that. The, the, the tailgate. Otherwise, I, I help my dog by leading them against my hip and taking the concussion off them jumping up or down. Um, a, a telephone pole on the ground with uh, a prop on it is uh, so that it's just elevated. The telephone pole, maybe like four inches off the ground, is one of the more challenging because it's actually slippery. Okay. And that's a really good one. We have a smaller balance beam that's maybe four inches wide. Um, this is a, an agility obstacle, but it's a huge challenge is the swinging tire. So you can add a swinging tire because when it moves, it scares them. Um, we got we got our new building put up the past couple of years and it came in these super long pallets. So you can stack pallets against each other and make that a slatted ladder to go up over so they have to know where they're putting their feet and we have that elevated. What a great way for a puppy to learn how to use their hind end and to learn where their feet are to navigate this challenging obstacle. Touch point of contact. She's really got to know where her feet are. Great for her core. Great for her confidence, great for her balance. Um, a wobble board. Wobble boards are awesome. And I've had my own ACL redone. And I, I did a lot of work on a wobble board. And a wobble board is about balance, agility, and um, sta joint stabilization, right? Uh, proprioception, joint stability. Girl. Um, man, it's super scary for them to step on. And then once they get on it, they're, uh, <laughs> yeah. they're like they're balancing, they're shaking. And you can only imagine how beautiful that is for joint stabilization. So not only is that a mental obstacle, it's a beautiful physical obstacle. Um, when a, a training partner and I were in a water area training for the invitational back in 2016, 
we love, we love to put our dogs in this thinking state of mind for the obstacles. So before we did our water crossing, there was a guardrail where we were and it was a wooden guardrail, like in a parking lot. Oh my gosh, our dogs were so challenged. So what did we put up in our challenge course? A guardrail. And it has a little ramp going up it. And then it has, it goes to a corner and it turns and it's got, uh, I can, I'll send you some videos of it or some pictures of it. That's super challenging. Um, the, uh, we take 55 gallon drums and we put them upright with tires around, um, I mean, I'll take, I'll take a bunch of pictures if yeah. you'd like, because we just keep adding to our challenge course. We've got our barrels with rubber tops coating on it. We've got a barrel with tractor tire. We've got the agility weave poles. This is the guardrail that we built that I really like that. The dogs have to walk up that, navigate it, pivot around. Truck bed. The uh, dog walk, another tire to just play with. It's an old John boat there on a tire, and it's fantastic because it's great for the dogs to learn how to go into a, into a John boat, and then if I pull it further on the tire, it becomes unstable like it would be on the water. I bought that used for 100 bucks. <laughs> We've got our different platforms, seesaw, <laughs> The A-frame, the telephone poles are very, very challenging because they're very slippery. And then this was uh, actually for this arena we just had delivered here uh, last year. These were pallets that part of the arena came on. We've got a balance beam there. We've got these barrels together and then this corrugated barrel which you can have dogs go through or up and over so a whole big variety and I think lastly the this is a longer telephone pole the swinging bridge which the underside is made of fire hose <laughs> girl anyway pretty challenging it's yeah. fabulous and, and since it started to make its way into the gun dog world i keep getting questions you know there's been some other podcasts that reference it and they and then a few people know that i've been kind of building my own and they're asking and, and I, i'm telling them i'm like guys think of anything like mm -hmm. think of anything i mean you, you know obviously be be safe about it don't yes. don't go ask you know don't go throw them off a building and you know call it parkour or anything it's be smart about it but you know most people i think when they think of these obstacles the first thing they think about is the a-frame or the stuff that the tubes or something that you would see in a typical agility course uh, and it's just like, it doesn't even have to be that it really is just a tabletop, you know, it's yeah. like, just build a, build a training table. Your force fetch table is, is one of them, you know, the planks and all this stuff. You just mentioned a telephone pole, you know, go get a log stuff like that. There's, there's all kinds of stuff that you can utilize and pallets. I have a pallet out there on, on uh, my end. I haven't even elevated any of it, but it really is just look around what you have and see if you can make an obstacle course out of it. Mm -hmm. And, and make sure that it's safe. We don't want it so slippery. They're going to fall off and get hurt. Um, I don't want customers' dogs going over an A-frame if the dogs aren't physically fit because a dog can get hurt on it. Please make sure that your dog's nail care, you're really into nail care because their, their toenails always should be nice and short, not hitting the ground because they could rip a toenail easily. Um so yeah, just, just be smart. We don't want any dog puppy to fall off them or get hurt. It's about building their confidence, not scaring the heck out of them. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, we, we've described what it's called and, and what it's made of in terms of the obstacles. Now, when as a, as a handler, I want to get into this. This is my first time trying it with my dog. Is there a right time? Is it an age restriction? You know, talk to me about the considerations that I should have as a, as a gun dog owner is it right for me and my dog? And, and is it right 
now that I should be going out there and trying to construct this and start the training? Sure. Um, I'll start a puppy on it at, at seven weeks old. Um, I'll even work that same puppy on the, the plank walk, you know, which is three, four foot off the ground. But by gosh, I am so protective of them. They are not going to fall off of that. They're also little puppies or smaller dogs are never going to have to jump up and down off anything probably more than six or eight inches because while a puppy is growing and has all their unstable growth plates, the last thing I want to do is do any type of joint damage. But what I want to do with a puppy is build a connection with them. I want to teach them confidence. I want to start teaching them right away about their hind end and about core strength. Um, they're learning how to learn. They're learning how to process things. Um, but it's just really, really important. I am their protector. I keep them safe and I don't do things, anything that's going to um, affect their joints. I'd, I'll start them as youngsters. Um, but even this 10 month old lab that I got last week, I'd love to share the story about her because I went from the first one minute of, and I made a video of it and her owner was horrified because he, he was like, Oh my God, she's never going to make a gun dog. Cause I'm like, yeah, look at, <laughs> and, and I, I say this in a way, um, your dog has been dumbed down by not knowing as a 10 month old, how to step up on a table when asked instead, it would rather flop over and die because it doesn't even understand how to problem solve, how to step on this table when I ask it. Right. Mm -hmm. And he was like, Oh, she's going to be a failure. Nick, 16 minutes later, I had her going through at least half of the obstacles with a light uh, point of contact pressure. 16 mm -hmm. minutes later, okay? We went from a dog that bit the leash, flopped over, was spitting, was having a meltdown to, oh, wow, I think this is kind of cool. And thank you, for, <laughs> thank you for challenging my brain and making me feel good about myself. You, there's something in the dog's expressions and again, I've little, legitimately worked thousands of dogs through this. They initially have a fight, freeze, or flight demeanor. I can't, I won't, I hate it, I'm a scared to death, I don't know how, to, oh my gosh, I just, they feel like they've earned a blue ribbon, <laughs> and, they, and you can see their expression, and you can also just see that look that went from terror and lacking confidence and not understanding to feeling really good about themselves. Yeah. Very it's it's beautiful. Yeah. You see the acceptance. Like you said, yeah. you kind of you kind of see them buy in. Mm -hmm. and, and I mean, again, I've only been doing this for a few weeks with mine, but you know, I saw it up at the Rick Smith seminar up in, in New York at Mark and Martha's. They had the course and and watching so many people working their dogs through the same obstacles and course, each dog, to your point, had a different initial response especially if they'd never been exposed to the course before and some of them took a little bit longer some of them came right around but they all eventually came around and they were all just you know they were licking their lips they were, they, they were just accepting it and buying mm -hmm. into it and then next thing you know they instead of waiting on a cue or something like that to your point they're all trying to jump up there they're trying yeah. to run up there they're trying to go too fast and it's just like oh we get to do this again and you can tell that the dogs are having fun just from yes. the variety of options that you give them yeah and then you break that down and you're like you know the the naysayer can look at it and say oh i think that's really stupid training for a dog well you can't deny the physical aspect of it because how can you compare taking your dog out and letting them free run or road to a full body core interactive workout? Yeah. <laughs> That's what yeah. it becomes, right? Yeah. So, so that alone, um, when Rick first started coming out to us, it, it was like 12 or 13 years ago. Um, and, and he's such a mentor and such a dear, dear friend. And he looked at the course and he kind of bit his lip and shook his head. And he was like, he wasn't bought in. He thought it was kind of BS. <laughs> and then not only did I show him, but we integrated in with all the students. And what Rick saw in that moment was the obstacles become a definitive black and white obstacle for not only the, the dog to navigate, 
but the human to navigate. And so it's like, I can say, you know, Nick, take your dog out, walk out that way and walk back this way or say, Nick, take your dog out and get them on the platform. And now like you have a goal and you have a task. And Rick saw this amazing learning curve with the dogs, but he, as he says, even more with the people. And it's funny because Rick then got really bought in. And I was like, Rick, I, I, I explained it through the, the elements of getting a dog really excited about going over all the obstacles to the point where now they want to run through it themselves. As you saw the video I sent you of my little, my little cocker spaniel, I taught her it, the obstacles. I let her off the leash. She runs and dubs the obstacles by herself on her own accord off leash. I mean, tell me that's not a dog having fun. And now watch what an enthusiastic student I have. You're a good girl. What a little peanut. I would be surprised if you went on the wobble board by yourself. Fetch. Good. What a good girl. What a good girl you are. God, she's fun. Well, now we've got a dog that's such an honor student that's so excited to go do the obstacles. Now for me, they become, well, I'm going to teach you not to break on the obstacles. The obstacles now I relate to a bird. She wants to jump onto an obstacle because it's fun. It might be, she, maybe she gets an endorphin rush. Maybe she feels accomplished. And now it further enables me to use my leash touch point of contact in her moment of breaking to go, mm -mm, and I make her sit and I make her wait. And then I, she waits for my cue to send her to the obstacle. Nick, this is a great, where I can, great way that I can show touch leash point of contact, touch walking up quickly to an obstacle. Got to sit and be still. Cue to go up there. Got to sit and be still. Steady on the obstacle. No matter if I pick the leash up, it's not your cue to get off. Cue you, cue you to get off. Come to heel. Sit and be still. Go to the obstacle. Steady on the obstacle, be still. So there's so many layers of the obstacle course or even a platform that I can integrate into your four basic go somewhere, be still, come to me, walk with me. Yeah. And, and I want to, I want to stay on this for a, a quick second because you know, people talk about repetitions in the field on birds. Mm -hmm. If we're going to create steadiness or get the opportunity for, for cueing the dog or even a correction, if, if necessary, the dog is so excited on the O course and there's so many obstacles and there's so many chances to going on and getting off and get and staying in the middle of it. You're multiplying the number of reps, so to speak, oh my or goodness. opportunities for the cues that will transfer over into the field. And so instead of only getting two, three, maybe five contacts in the field and opportunities, you get that within almost every single obstacle when you get to that level. And we understand like, yes, it is the drive to that dog to that obstacle the same thing as the drive to the bird? No, but it is still teaching them to control their drive and their behavior based on the cues and corrections. Am I, am yeah. I hitting it right? Yep, absolutely. I mean, upwards anywhere between 20 and 30 obstacles we have, you name it. I mean, that that alone can be 20 reps. And I usually like to go through the obstacle course a couple, you know, two or three times. You, you're turning into uh, 40 to 60 reps. And now you integrate 
a steadiness drill before stepping onto it, is your well or your hup, then a, a release to the obstacle, then a steadiness on the obstacle, then you can either release them off to walk with you or half the time I practice a come to heel. So now I practice the repetition of leash, touch, point of contact, cue, come to be, come to heel. Um, you nailed it. it. It gives you so many reps in a variety that you're not beating against your head against a wall of boredom because you were doing it in a yard, yeah. right? And it gives the dogs just something, you know, you're either on the obstacle or you're not. And when you're on it, you're doing it right, dog. When you're off, when you're, if you're, if I tried to simulate that with a mat, just a mat on the ground, I don't believe that they understand fully if they've got a toe hanging off or if they have right. a foot off with an obstacle elevated, you're on it or you're off. Yeah. And, and that just goes back to, we've all heard about it. There's something about just getting the dogs off the ground, just getting your dogs elevated there's something to that to where they're focused on you. You know, that's the whole purpose or pretense behind a training table, a woe barrel, you, you name it. it. Uh, it's it's just getting that dog off of the ground. So you've mentioned point of contact, you know, for us to cue, correct, stop, you know, all that stuff built into the into the equation here. We have to have the point of contact. How do we go about do, is one one type of point of contact better than the other? Does it have to be a lead or can it be an e-collar eventually? Kind of walk me through what you require of a dog when it comes to that point of contact. Sure. Um, did we want to, did, did we want to talk about the wonder lead? Um, because that's, that's how I use my, my, okay. So yes. I'm a huge fan of the Huntsmith wonder lead. Um, the wonder lead, um, was originally developed, uh, by Delmar Smith, who's quite the horseman, uh, also can be called a pig and string, a lasso, a lariat. It's a, a waxed poly, um, line that I love it. It doesn't feel good on your hands. Good. That it shouldn't, because if you're having white knuckles to grip a leash and you're holding a leash that hard, then you're manhandling your dog, which means you're forcing them. You're not teaching them to yield to pressure. That's a lot right there. Yeah. So there's videos how to put a wonder lead on. I can even do it in a video. There's very correct ways to put a wonder lead on of the letter P, depending off they're going to heal off your right or your left. The very important concept of the wonder lead is that when it's put on, it should go as high on the neck as possible behind the back crown of the head and under their jaw. Because when you can control a dog's head, you can then control their body, right? You don't believe that or you need some justification. Look at the Westminster dog show this year. Everybody's walking their dogs on a, a, a little, little tiny chain or slip lead. And at the end, when there's a winner, all of the handlers can go up and hug each other and congratulate each other. And they're all have the dogs up on the highest so that they can control their head. So now the Great Dane is not fighting with the Malamutes, not fighting with yeah. the, the pit bull. Okay. So your, your goal is to control their head. When a leash or collar starts going lower on the neck, now it goes over the windpipe. And so what a traditional choke chain has the capability to go down lower and actually choke off their wind. We're not looking to do that. We're looking to have it high up to control the head. Okay, so that the placement is super important. So first snug it on, put on the placement. I start my dogs, I do this a little differently than Rick, but it's what works for me. It's what works for my customers. It's how I, how I train an untrained dog or even a puppy. I start with a drill I call an attention drill. And I'll hold the very end of the wonder lead, which has a leather stopper at the end. I hold it between two fingers with my palm of my hand facing me. And now the dog has six foot of the leash to learn. And what I'm doing with this attention drill 
is I'm on the ground, I'm on the grass or, or a driveway. And I just start walking. And any time the dog pulls, I turn, tug, and go 180 degrees. And I continue. I don't need to yank. I can give a little tug, tug, tug. I don't want to pull the dog off his feet. But I want to do a, a turn and a little abrasive tug to say, hey, dog, when you disengage and you go off your direction, I'm going to turn and go away from you my direction. And it's it's pretty magical because within minutes, the dog realizes, okay, if I take my eyes off you or if I pull, you leave my area and you're going in a different area and, and I get a, a tug on the leash. And the progression becomes that they start following you. So what you're doing is you're starting to create neck touch point of contact. And there's different elements of this game that I play where now if they come into my space, I'll turn into them, I'll stomp my feet and I'll walk right through them. So now they have to be respectful of my space to get out of my way. And the moment, again, they look away or pull, I turn, tug, and go, turn, tug, and go, turn, tug, and go. And what this does, it ultimately creates this point of contact that when I touch the leash, the dog moves in with me. The, the goal of point of contact is for the dog to move or yield into the pressure. And for them, ultimately, to do it willingly with the light, lightest amount of pressure. Okay. So in my opinion, and how I love to teach people with the wonder lead, you should never be white knuckling any leash. The more you were to wrap a leash around your hands and pull, the more your dog actually will fight against the pressure. The okay? opposition reflex. Opposition. And going back to natural horsemanship training, where you use a rope halter on a horse on two pressure points on their nose and on the top of their head, their pull. And your goal is to apply pressure. And the moment they give just a little bit, you release pressure. The learning is on the, the release. Okay. The learning is when they actually give, give, give. So that's the learning moment. And I can't, I'm going to go horseback riding later. I cannot pull my horses onto my horse trailer. They have to learn to politely lead, right? As a younger trainer, I pulled my dogs everywhere. I pulled them into a crate. I pulled them before I really got more savviness and I brought the horsemanship training into it and I really started to learn. Why are we forcing dogs to do them? I don't force my horses. I'll get killed. And when you teach an animal to yield to pressure and it's their decision they willingly go to the pressure they willingly okay 
So teaching to yield to pressure and move into the point of contact, you're ultimately trying to get rid of resistance. And resistance is the fight, the freeze, or the flight. And pretty much every dog will go through every one of those. So you get the dog that's the puller, puller, puller. And that's the dog that's wanting to get away. And that's always worked. Well, when you take that off the table, they're like, wow, that that's, I've always been able to pull my owner. Then they might freeze and now they won't budge at all. And now mm. you're trying to go and the dog just completely freezes. They go through all three phases, but you keep persisting with a touch point of contact, touch, touch. And again, I'll make a video of this for you because it's super cool. And now they pull out their last thing because they couldn't get away. That's been successful for them. They couldn't freeze. Now it turns to a fight and the fight becomes, they jump at you, they jump on you, they bite the leash or they bite you. <laughs> and, and every day it's a part of training at QK. And it's not because we were forcing them. We were teaching them point of contact. And in the past, their success had been able to fight, freeze or flight. They didn't know how to yield to pressure. So when I talk about leash touch point of contact with the wonder lead, the ultimate goal is to use fingertips on the leash that when I apply the most gentlest of a cue, okay, it's, we call it a cue, the dog yields to the pressure. Which direction? Up, down, left, right, forward, towards me, okay? Which becomes cast to the right, cast to the left, go away, go hunt them up, go fetch the bird, go do the retrieve, or come to me, right? Now I can use that same leash touch point of contact, go to the obstacle out front, go to the obstacle to the left, stay on that obstacle, recall off that obstacle. So the obstacles are uh, enable me to challenge and work my leash touch point of contact. Mm. And I mean, that's, I think so much of that is we get into this world, we get these dogs and it doesn't even have to be the first one. It's just like people just keep doing it over and over again. You see so many people that have these wonder leads and they don't ever really apply them correctly, or at least yeah. in the sense that you, you described it. And that's why you're standing around at the parking area at, at you know, pick your event with a whole bunch of dogs and everybody's wrestling with their dogs. Uh -huh. You know, everybody's yanking on them, yanking on them and the point of contact. And and I have to remind myself sometimes to where it's like if you're giving them a cue and they don't respond, it's not that they didn't feel the cue the first time. It's just that they don't they're not responding to the cue. Right. Mm -hmm. So like by you yanking on it, you might physically be able to manipulate that dog and bring them with you. But, but that dog heads. Yeah, you're butting heads and that dog's not buying in. And so you're never going to create that behavior that you really want with that cue. And that's something that I've really been focusing on a lot more this summer as, I, uh, as I'm as i focusing on getting the head, as I call it, is, is getting their focus. And you call it the attention drill. But this is it, it's really powerful stuff when you see somebody just like in an e-collar, somebody that uses it wrong it's horrible to watch. And then oh somebody that really knows how to use it, it it's really eye-opening into what, just how simple of a tool such as the Wonderly can be so beneficial for you and your dog. So the Wonderly is your my complete foundational training tool to teach neck touch point of contact, okay? Um, I've heard you guys have done a bunch of episodes about the woe post and the woe post, whether it be on the flank or the rump, teaches point of contact on the belly or the rump, which then you overlay with an e-collar to get a sit or a woe. And again, you're trying to establish touch means move into the pressure, not fight, freeze, or flight it. And your goal with the woe post, your goal with the wonder lead is how efficient and proficient can you learn to communicate with your dogs in all types of adversities equals obstacles to get them to lightly cue off of the leash. When you've got that, then you can go to e-collar overlay. Yeah. But but to an e-collar overlay for us becomes this is this is how I super effectively use it. And I'm able to teach people because so many people are truly afraid of an e-collar. They're afraid of messing their dogs up. Well, you should be, because an e-collar is a tool that 
if and when you slap on a dog, and so many people do this, my dog won't come when he's called, he's not listening, I'll slap an e-collar on him, I'll light him up, and really your dog at that moment, this is horrible, is responding to something that hurt, and they fight, freeze, or flight. If you're lucky, they flight back toward you, or they freeze, or they run away, okay? And that is so not the way to use an e-collar. That's abusive. It's 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 bad. The, a proper way, the only way, in my opinion, is that you teach a dog point of contact first. And then once they understand what the pressure means, you then overlay. What does that mean? As I'm touching the leash to establish point of contact, I will give a light nick of the e-collar so that they're feeling that sensation. The ultimate goal is I then guide with the leash, point of contact drive with an e-collar touch. And on a Garmin Pro 550, I'm able to do almost my entire course with a low to medium one to get a dog to go, be still, come to me, low level one, without even having to talk. I can, I in con contextual, point to it, send them, keep them, all with a light one. That is how we do our e-collar conditioning program. Yeah, I, I love it. So you just touched on something really important and where I was going with next. It's almost you you knew exactly where I was going with this, the verbal side of this. You just said you're not saying anything. It's all point of contact. It's touch, whether that's with the leash or you eventually overlay the e-collar and now you can work it with the e-collar. Do you ever work in verbal cues? And and it's really interesting. Just last night, uh, that sidebar, a little story here, and you can kind of tell me your thoughts on this is Quinn, my setter puppy, is I've been working at the O course. Everything is point of contact. It's all leash, right? So there's no verbals. Just last night as we're going, going to bed, I'm putting all the dogs in the kennel. Lucy and Rachel shoot in. I shut the door. And Quinn is just sitting there. The, the door is barely cracked. And she's just sitting there like waiting on me to open the door for her. And I'm just like, no, you you can open the door and get in your own kennel, right? And so she's perceiving it as a challenge, but she's just standing there, just looking at it. And I'm just waiting her out. And finally, I'm like, all right, well, I don't have a verbal command. I mean, I guess I could say kennel or whatever, but she knows exactly what I'm expecting of her. And so I just barely reach down there and literally just barely touch her collar on her neck. Mm -hmm. And what does she do? She immediately just swings the door open and goes in point of contact with, without me saying anything. And I'm just yeah. sitting there. I'm like, there's that point of contact. It's transitioned from outside to inside on a very basic thing, such as the kennel. But it, you know, people swear by those verbals. A lot of people want those verbals. So tell me where the verbal uh, cues fall into, in, sure. into Jen's world. I hate the verbals. <laughs> um, so a great, um, I just took, I think I had mentioned to you, I just took a four day leadership course. And one of the portions of it was this um, um, communications expert. This woman was an expert on body language. She helped pick juries. She helped teach, she helps teach people. She's worked on like murder cases because she can read if a person's lying. She, it's, she's a body language expert, right? which dogs are body language experts. Cause let me know which of our dogs are ever born understanding any verbal language. They're right. all about their body language. So she had us do this exercise where she went, touch your cheek, touch your chin, touch your cheek, touch your chin, touch your cheek, touch your chin. And then she said, touch your chin, but she moved her hand to her cheek. Everybody so she followed. Went, so she, everybody followed. Well, actually half followed. And she said, those of you that followed and touched cheek are more visual. Those of you that kept on your chin are, are more verbal, right? Um, in general, dogs are, dogs are uh, physical. Dogs, dogs are visual. Dogs watch each other's body language. And the problem that I have, do I use verbal cues? Absolutely. But I feel it and I emit the verbal cue with my body language. So when I send you, I project and send you. When I call you, I become receiving. And I've gotten really good at this because you can't call a horse into you with an aggressive stance. You better have a relaxed, inviting stance. You know, horses don't really do verbal cues. Horses are really all about physical cues. And because they're a flight animal, they're a predator, 
they're much more predisposed to flight. So you better be very savvy with your body language. Um, our dogs are so domesticated. And um, I'm just going to say it. People have diarrhea of the mouth when it comes yeah. to dogs. And the thing that I see often, uh, I'll get a customer coming, picking up their dog. And when I recall a dog, I have a gentle, I want them to come to me. I have a loving attitude. Yet the owner will be like, here. <laughs> well, <laughs> I wouldn't want to come to you if you're doing that. Okay. Yeah. Um, so what happens is that people inadvertently, most often, project the opposite with their body language is what they do with their verbal. Okay. So if I can get my customers to concentrate more on their body language and what it projects and what it means, because ultimately, wouldn't you rather Nick want to hunt with me as your hunting partner? If I was just cueing my dogs off of my body language versus that person that's screaming at them. Oh yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And, um, yeah, I do use verbal cues, but I don't repeat commands often. When I do say a command, a dog has, um, a, a one, 1,000, two, 1,000 to respond. Um, people often are so quick to correct their dog for not listening to a command. And I know I watch that dog. That dog had no idea what the owner was actually asking because their body was portraying something different than their voice. Or the dog was in the middle of doing something and they they said the word so quickly without context that the dog failed and now the dog gets corrected for it. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm all ultimately about the verbal, but I teach nonverbal 90% of it. Yeah. And so walk, walk me through what a typical, and I know it's, it's going to vary every single time you go out, probably more or less, unless you have a specific obstacle that you're working or concentrating mm -hmm. on. Walk me through what an actual session in the obstacle course looks like with, with a normal dog and, and describe it in terms of like verbal, if you're doing any corrections, or is it all just the cues like that? So um, you you do keep saying corrections. Um, when it comes to the obstacle course and I don't really correct around the obstacle course, um, until it becomes well into intermediate, if not advanced stuff. Um, so let's go back to, let's, I think this lab might be a great example, uh, who, who arrived, uh, a week and a half ago, Monday morning, I took her out to the obstacle course. She had no leash touch point of contact. So I did the attention drill with her first. I established a decent point of contact just doing my attention drill and turning circles. And then I took just the table and I used my leash touch point of contact to get her on that table. It was a struggle. Now, here's a really cool thing um, and, a, and a learning opportunity for, for some of the guests, the listeners. Um, so she did not want to go on this table. Now, what I do with my point of contact is I like to be like a dripping faucet, bump, bump, bump the leash, okay? So I'm using minor pressure. I'm just using fingertips and I'm suggest, suggest, suggest. And this is what she did was textbook typical. I mean, I wish I had it on a video. I have a table in front of her that's 36 inches by 36 inches wide and it's 20 inches off the ground, right? I know this, I saw this dog jump into her owner's truck. So I know she knows how to jump. She gets to the table and blinks it. She won't look at it. Okay. <laughs> we know that term blinking. Okay. Cause yeah. we can create a dog blinking on a bird by screwing up hundred percent gets to the table and says, literally what table I'm like, game on. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> what a beautiful learning opportunity, girl. So I start bumping the leash toward it. At which point she's like, what table, what table looks left to right. Wants no part of the table. She'll take a step back from the table. I keep bumping. I stop my bumping the moment they give their first try. 
Now, this is where a lot of people try to manhandle it. Well, what's a try? It could be that she stops and she looks at the table for a minute. It could be that she relaxes and maybe she licks her lips a little bit. It's something with a change of behavior that I see her in a moment acknowledge the table. <laughs> so I pause. There's a learning moment. I Now it becomes a chess match or what is she going to do? And then I counteract her move. Okay. So if she looks at it, I'll let her stare at it. Now, if she looks away, I go back to bumping again. Ah, and my okay. goal, my goal is it's not about how quickly I can get you on the table, but it is how efficiently in moves I can get you on the table. And I'm very efficient in my moves. So if you've looked at it, then I'm only letting you look at you're not allowed to not look at it now, right? Once you bought up to this point, we're not going you're back. In, you're girl. only going forward. Okay. Yeah. So in terms of correction, I might dig in a little bit and correct a fight, freeze, or flight. I'm going to encourage, encourage, encourage to get effort, right? And the moment I get effort, any change in behavior, there's your learning moment. Pause and let them chew on it. But now if all of a sudden she rears back and goes to flight, yeah, I'll give her a leash pop and a leash correction. Boom, right? Here's what's so cool. They try the flight, the freeze, the fight. And I'm like, as long as you're trying, I'm going to bump you. But the moment you refuse or show me, you know, fight, freeze, or flight, if in that moment I give you a quick jerk, the dogs, a flip suddenly switches and they jump on the obstacle. Now, I watched people do it all the time. I watched them do it different ways, and I'm going to call it or some wrong ways where they're forcing, they're forcing, they're forcing, and they don't take the moment to acknowledge and reward the dog's acknowledgement, that learning moment, and the dog then actually barrels back harder, harder. And while those people can ultimately manhandle the dog or it takes a little longer with a hole, it doesn't look pretty. Mm-hmm. I play this chess game with going with the dogs where I read their move and I counteract them. And if you're trying, so, so you can try, 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 and you can fail at your trying, but you have to try. Yeah. So when I see a refusal for trying is where I'll dig in a little bit more. As soon as you master and accomplish this with the table, that table, I go to the next table and I tend to go to really easy flat surface things first, Coranda bed, Cato board, flat top table. Um, we've got a couple flat top tables. Once I get like four of those flat top tables using that methodology, then I might go to the barrel on its side with a rubber top or something a little bit higher. And now the learning curve suddenly just goes like this. So that dog that I did a week ago, week and a half ago, where, you know, doing the hot tuna on the ground, having a meltdown because she didn't want to try. In five minutes, less than that, got over that, went to the next obstacle, learned it in one minute, went to the next obstacle, learned it in 30 seconds. And then we started to go to the other ones and you see her going, oh, I get it. I get it. And again, it's on video in 16 minutes, this dog now with fingertips is going through things and she's 10 pounds overweight. And she had no idea previously of training. She just got to be a dog. Yeah. Okay. And she's now like literally looks like she's about to step on the Olympic podium because she won a gold medal. <laughs> because you could you could you could see her emitting this feeling also of I call it kind of releasing the demons. She didn't understand how to learn. She didn't understand how to use her body. She didn't understand how to follow a point of contact. Um to be successful with something and her MO and her former success was to fight freezer flight. Now I put her on her first bird yesterday, a chucker, and it was brilliant. She, she, I've been building her for a whole week and a half and teaching her to really be a dog before I even showed her a bird. Cause if I would have showed it to her the day she arrived, I don't think she would have been successful. Um, I was holding her, her collar 
because I pulled the feathers out and I went to, this was by the fourth tucker, I went to throw it. She all of a sudden started to do an alligator roll while I was holding her collar. And it's funny because I saw her do that to the owner when he got here, when he went to try to get her out of the car. She, what she did was she wheels back in flight and rolls. So I'm going, oh, I saw this on the course. I could see this on a bird. This isn't going to happen on a bird again. I'm not going to put myself in that position. We're going to make sure we get rid of those demons on the course. Right. You know, and, and, and there's so much to unpack there because, you know, to follow up on what you just finished with, that's that's kind of what Rick was talking about. You know, whether it's the O course or the the chain gang, what you see in their behaviors there, you're going to see out in the field. Like you just said, you saw it in the truck, you saw it in the course, you saw it around birds. And then th this was you touch on something that I've personally had questions about myself as we we talk about we don't ask for perfection we ask for improvement mm -hmm. but then you know how do you communicate to that dog with the with the point of contact yes you you just you took that next step without you know most of us are so used to the verbal markers yes good you know that that's when normally we would in, inject ourselves and tell her but by you just stopping that drip stopping that little light tug on the point of contact that's you telling the dog you're you're essentially marking the behavior without mm -hmm. any kind of verbal and just by taking the drip away. I learned this from the Smith family. My form of um, acknowledgement, connection, and reward for a dog is that touch on the withers. Mm -hmm. So I put my hand and touch the withers. My my problem with verbal praise is that people often will teach their dog a context of a verbal praise that emits excitement, not acknowledgement of something good. And when you get a dog in an excited mode, they suddenly almost undo what you just asked them to do. So my form of acknowledgement is with a, a very soft, loving, affirm, affirming touch. And it's that bond and it's that connection. It's like Linda Tellington Jones stuff. It's, it's different areas on a on an animal's body that you can touch that actually helps to relax them versus antagonistic excitement head to head so um th there's people that's very successfully use markers you know like you said yes or whatever i never want my acknowledgement to undo the behavior or emit excitement i want it to be a, a calming affirmation a bonding a connection so i do a lot of bonding and connection i'll just dog goes up i'll touch it and and i also want them to really learn that my touch means that they relax my touch is a really good thing so that when i touch you when you're on point when i'm soothing you you relax at my hands you don't break wiggle or get excited which is what most people teach their dogs when they touch that's, that's that was my next question is what uh, do you do with the dogs that you know they see you going to touch them or maybe you just touch them and they didn't know that then all of a sudden they're looking at you trying to lean into you and, and just or sit down or or just the response mm -hmm. that undoes the behavior that you're trying to communicate to them that, then i don't touch job. at all yeah so i measure the dog my, my puppies i all raise that my touch is total relaxation my touch is massage for them my touch is my touch emits a calming connection i will that's why I don't even usually like people to touch my puppies because people go ah, and teach them to wiggle <laughs> even more. Okay. Yeah. I want to respectfully touch a dog so that my touch emits relaxation, bonding, connection. I want it to be the default of a sit or a woe. Yep. Right. That's yep. what I teach. Um, every dog that comes to me, you touch. Well, the, the owners have taught muscle memory that their touch emits excitement, wiggliness breaking up undoing of behaviors. So I just won't touch that dog. I won't even acknowledge it. I have to work that dog. And, um, you know, I'll sometimes just say, it. you know, Nick, I'm such a good leader to the dogs. Just me enabling them to be in my presence is a reward. Yeah. Why no, do I have to tell them how great they are? Um, it doesn't mean I'd, I'd love to touch them, but if they can't handle the touch because they lose it, then I'm not going to go there. Yeah. So a couple follow-up questions on that. What do you say to the guy or person, and it might just be a, a lost cause in this, where their response is, well, you know, 
part of me owning a dog is I want to enjoy my dog and I want to pet my dog. I want to wrestle with the dog. I want, I want to get them excited. You, you have that aspect. And then conversely, say somebody's done that. They've seen the dog respond the way you're describing it. Can you undo years of that buildup? Can you eventually get them to where they just accept that calming touch without that negative response that we're looking at? So for the people who want to just roughhouse wrestle, rough their dogs up. You have the dog you deserve based on how you <laughs> interact with them. Yeah. And if that's the knuckleheaded response that you want, that your dog is <gasps> and, and is is reverberating all the time. And if that's your wheelhouse and that's what you want, that's fine. That's not what I want. It's not what I want for my hunting dogs that I'll live in my house. Mm -hmm. It's not what I want when I travel with them. It's not what I want when I hang out with them, take them to a brewery, take them on the boat, touch them. It's not what I want. Um, and what I honestly don't understand in society is that you don't touch your loved one like that. You don't rough your kids up like that. We don't touch our husband or wives like that then why the heck do you teach, do you handle a dog like that? It is, it is antagonistic to rough them up. It is, it's like you shaking your dear friend's hand and smiling and maybe giving them a pat versus you see him, you run up, you chest bump them, and then you rough them all up. <laughs> and, and is that how you interact with your friends? And if that's how, if you and I, every time we met, we chest bumped when we started wrestling with each other. Okay. If that's what people are doing with their dogs, that's the dog that you're going to have. And and the thing is, is it creates this intense littermate buddy with your dog that, well, then it's pretty unfair for you to step back and say, now I want you to listen to me. Well, you're just his buddy. You were just bar friends. And now you're trying to micromanage him. I th I think it's really unfair. Um it's really hard to change that mindset with people. However, if you really, really deep dig deep into it, it's not how we interact with each other. So why, where in society has it become the norm that people get dogs super excited, super roughed up, super wiggly? Um, I think I think that it's actually really disrespectful to a dog. And I, I wish that people were more experts on studying dog behavior, because the more that they're actually wiggling and having those meltdowns, it's actually, a, it's actually anxiety. It's excitement and anxiety. Now, I love my dogs to have elements of excitement and anxiety in their lives before getting a bird, playing with each other. But I certainly don't want them stuck in that type of muscle memory when they're in my presence when I'm trying to teach them, because now I don't have a dog in a thinking state of mind. So you can, you can treat your dog however you want, but you have the dog you deserve based on how you treat them. Yeah. And technically that, that extends far past just the touch thing. You know, the dogs that you, we have today are the dogs that we deserve from everything that we've built up to this point. Yep. And that's, that goes back to, you know, fill in the blank on who's come on this show. You talked about it earlier. You're, you're constantly trying to improve. You're constantly trying to get better the good trainers, the good people with the experience, that's what they're always trying to do. And it's funny, you know, I'm reminded, I think Rick said it on the recent episode I did with him to where if you treat a dog like a person, that dog's going to treat you like a dog. And then you're proving mm -hmm. a point right here to where us trying to te treat a dog like a person in that instance, we're not even technically teach treating them like a person because we don't do that to other people. Thank you. And, Thank you. And then, yeah. <laughs> By extension, if you really think about it, like I can't think of another animal or another social situation outside of dogs that people think it's acceptable to just go up and start touching. You know, nobody does that to other people's kids. It's just like, oh, you have a kid? Let me go rub his Let head. Let me rub them like, up. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's like it doesn't make any sense. And but it is the society and the culture that we live in to where you know, fill in the blank of why you might think it. there'd be a million theories out there as to why, but I'm with you. I wish people would kind of get out of that frame of mind. And I love dogs. You love dogs. But just because we see a dog out at Lowe's or something on an outing, 
who cares? It's a dog. Yeah. <laughs> you know, here's the thing too. It's so funny. You know, yeah, the person who were who at my Lowe's or they see my dog and they're like, can I pet your dog? Um, sure. Can I, can I pet your, your husband? <laughs> okay. <laughs> my, my dog doesn't know you. And my dog usually doesn't want to be pet by you. And when they go, oh, it smells my dog. My dog could usually give a crap about you. In fact, here's a, here's a really funny thing when I'm working obedience with people. I say, the more your dog wants to pull and get to another dog or other people, the more your dog wants to get away from your leadership because you're not a leader. If you were really a pack and you proved your beautiful leadership and connection, your dog would actually walk with you and tune out the outside world. So you start watching, this is hysterical, people pass by and the dogs that lunge at the end of the leash to either attack another dog or want to go get to play with the other dog, they don't respect the person at the other end of the leash. They're not, they're not, they're not partnered with them. Yeah. Um, and um, I was just, I uh, just drove to Baltimore to, to deliver a dog recently. And I, I had my short hair and, and a field trial lab in this downtown Baltimore dog park. Like it wasn't, it was there was a fenced in dog area, but, but there was dogs of every breed and there was dogs. Most of them were on harnesses, no pull harnesses pulling. And they were all over the place. And here's my hunting dogs just walking beautifully by my side. They were actually off leash on e-collars. And they could care less about anything except when the pigeons and ducks all of a sudden arrived at the park. <laughs> but they were so cued in with me at, and, and our own pack. They didn't want to go play. They didn't want to go to the neighbors and, and play. So, yeah. yeah. Um, I, I really, really wish that society treated dogs differently with more respect. Because just, you said it, you don't rough someone else's kid up. You don't rough someone else's husband, wife, sister up the way that, and you go, and if you look at the Volhard puppy test, because I've done that with my puppies, that the stages that you test a little puppy, one of the steps is dominance petting, where you go from head to tail yeah. and you stroke a dog. That's actually dominant. Now think of it. Now you, Nick, want to come and start stroking and petting my short hair? To me, that's antagonistic to her. You haven't earned the right. You know, it's it's basically antagonistic. And sure, she could turn and bite you. You just tried to dominate her with a pet. Um, there's a great horse trainer. I, I love this quote. He says, I don't pet my horses. I touch my horses. So he doesn't do the pat, 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 pat. And I've really adopted that with my dogs. I don't pet them. I touch them. Mm -hmm. And I try to touch them in spots that's massaging and soothing and connecting. Now, will I scratch them on the butt and, and, and some of them that like it? Yeah. But my dogs and I are best friends. And there's times that I'll hit their feel good spots, <laughs> you know, yeah. and, and, and get a little bit more intense but that's few and far in between. And it also means more because it's few and far between. I, I wished some random masseuse was near me all the time, massaging me <laughs> as much as I pet and massage my dogs because everybody, I just want, we're just, we just touch them. And isn't that a beautiful thing? Yeah, yeah. no, it, it, it's true. And, and, as we start kind of wrapping this up, I got I got a couple questions to get back to the course because we need to we need to circle back around and have mm -hmm. a uh, how to fix society roundtable episode with a number of trainers because there's so so many ways to go down that path. There is, but just putting myself back into the hunting dog owner mentality. How does this help me kill birds? How does this help me find birds when you're working in the in the course? Do you ever expose or bring the bird into the course? What I mean by that is if they're standing there and they're at the top of the A-frame or whatever, do you fly away? Do you fly sure. birds? Do you bomb let, them with them? Let me let me let me make this even way easier for everybody. Let's let's reduce the course down to the Cato board, our our good friend Josh, uh Jordan. Um yeah. and so you don't need the 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 challenge course is the icing on the cake because that's you know it's fun for all 
but let's just bring it to a Cato board. Um, and, and with Betty. So I use the Cato board to wonder lead point of contact, get her on there, get her on there, get her on there. So we're up over on up over on. And so I get her comfortable with it. Now I use point of contact to start sending her to it, sending her to it, sending her to it. She tries to get off, boom, send her right back to it. And I'm creating now a muscle memory that she wants to get on there. So now when I try to walk by it, guess what she wants to do? She wants to go up there. At first, I let her go up there because I really, really want her to love it, right? And um, But now I'm starting to work a go to a destination, stay there and be still. So I'll get her there and I might drop the leash or step away. What does she do? Get off the board. I bring her right back. I don't even say anything. The board becomes the sense of comfort, comfort, discomfort. Off the board means I get to gently tug, 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 tug the leash. On the board is the release of pressure. So she wants to go now on the board. Um, I'm creating the board as a destination place, which becomes now my steadiness place. Um, I also integrate the board with her with retrieves. So I take a tennis ball, a paint roller, a soft toy when she was three, four, five months of age. Hey, you want this toy? You want this toy? Get on the board first. All she had to do was touch the board all four feet and I'd throw the toy. That was her reward. So I built her up with that as a puppy, three, four, five months of age. So it's five months when I really started her leash touch point of contact. I, I get her on the board. Now I'm starting to integrate some steadiness work with the bumper. So I might just drop the bumper behind me because I don't want to take away her retrieving desire. And if she steps off, it's not about the, the bumper. It's about off the board. So I get her back up and I might pick it up. It's how I integrate my steadiness work. If you asked if I use it for birds, absolutely. Down the line, after I've integrated that I send it as a destination, I use it to sit and be still. I proof it. If I can throw my hat, if I can throw toys, if I can walk around, if I can do other things and I've proofed it because she's staying there, absolutely I'll integrate a bird. Um, no heavy level corrections at all because it's not about correcting for a bird. If I send you to the platform, I should be able to have a circus come by and your job is to stay on the platform. I could now throw a bird. If you chase the bird, it's not about chasing the bird. It's about getting you back onto the platform, right? So I'll do a pigeon on a string and fly it all around them. And because previously I've taught a release command on a tennis ball or a bumper, I will send her to go get it. So it becomes a steadiness drill. But even going back before that further, I use that same board also for a come to heel. So I'll point of contact, touch them, cue to come to heel. Um, they get so much reward from being on the board because the board's a safe place that they try to break to the board all the time. That means that the moment I even try to walk by it, she's like, I'm going to be an honor student. I'm going to run to the board. I'm like, gosh, you're, you're so smart. You're so good. But you know, <laughs> I didn't ask you to run to the board. So I'll give just a little tug because we're in a healing drill. One of the things that's kind of neat that you'll see about Betty is how much compulsion I've created that the moment she sees an obstacle, she wants to drive to it really hard. So the moment she sees one, boom, she typically wants to go right to it. There she goes. So what I can then start working on is what I'll call my steadiness to an obstacle. So now if I go to approach the stairs and she wants to bolt ahead, there's my little leash touch point of contact. I can work on a sit or a hup before. I could take one more step closer. I can work on a sit or a hup before, and then I could cue her to go onto the obstacle. So that's where the obstacles work great because you get a puppy so excited about going on them that then all they want to do is go on the obstacles. They have so much compulsion, which I really, really want, but then it enables me to start working on what I'll call steadiness to an obstacle. Leave it. Good girl. So I, I challenge her with, walk with me, go to the board, come to me off the board, and stay on the board. And, and now it's the four things. Go, be still, come with, walk with, come to, walk with, right? All using that board. I mean, 
I would get bored if all I used was that. I love to use ultimately the whole challenge course, but I could super, super successfully train any hunting dog for steadiness also with just a board. I could do all my leash touch point of contact. I could do my e-caller overlay. I could do my woe training and my steadiness training with that. Mm. Yeah. So last question, and I, and I told you when we were linking up a week or two ago that I was going to ask this, is you've heard a, a few people as this becomes more and more popular uh, within gun dog training to where some people are saying that they have found that the challenge course has completely replaced the woe post for them. Mm -hmm. What What's your thought onto that? Has this completely replaced the woe post for you? No, not at all. Um, so I, I want to, let me keep that thought, go back to the, the pigeon and the, the Cato board for one second Yeah. for people that are saying, well, how does that still relate to the field work? It has given you, like you said before, dozens and dozens, if not hundreds of repet hundreds of repetitions to overlay leash, touch point of contact, e-collar. Then if you want to name it, you can name it, go to place, sit or whoa, right? So you've got that. Now, when you do take them out into the field, your your foundation goal is still about the go somewhere, be still, be steady, not about correcting them on the birds. So that that's where it ultimately integrates. And, and we can dive deeper into that at some yeah. point, but it does. It totally integrates to the field work. Um, so the, I follow, again, the Hunt-Smith method for the woe post for um, – uh, creating a sit for a flushing dog or a retriever or a wolf for a pointing dog. And one of the things that's hugely beneficial about the world pose that can be different from barrel, which I've never learned the barrel training. I'd love to learn it, but I, I haven't. Um, but it's also different with creating where some people um, might use that, the challenge course instead of a woe post is that the application of using the woe post is getting a dog to be still when you're not right at them. And you, you mechanically have the means to get them to stand still because of the, the peg in the ground, they're in the middle, and you're 15 to 20 feet away at the end of a check cord. And you can gently manipulate them to be still, not being by their side. Okay. Um, before I learned the low post, when I would train retrievers, there's a big difference between teaching a dog to sit at your side. And here's the thing, you do so much muscle memory of walk, stop, sit, walk, stop, sit, that before I knew any better, when I try to get them to remote sit, their muscle memory had them running back to me to sit. They're like, I can't sit out there. Sitting uh, means by your side, okay? Yeah. So the woe post became aha moments for me that you're applying pressure when a dog is moving, release of pressure when they stop and, they, and they're still, and they can enjoy the released pressure without you having to physically be right there with them. Um, there's There's a whole lot deeper dives, and I think, Rick Smith, ultimately, I mean, you've done a video, uh, a, a podcast with him. I think he's one of the best people to truly be able to, or Ronnie, describe the Hunt Smith method of the woe post. Yeah. They're, the mas they're the masters at it. They're who I've learned from. And we could spend the next two hours talking about <laughs> just the woe post because there's so many elements to it. Right. Um, and I, you know, I've been such a student of the woe post. Um by putting a flank strap on a dog suddenly and asking them to do the challenge course, well, some dogs don't even like to be touched there and they're really goosey. So they're gonna they're gonna throw you a little bit of a fit there. Um, because the idea is establishing point of contact. But I think um it it has its merits. I still love to start with the woe post ultimately. And then I will use the flank collar and I'm about to do it because I've been woe posting two dogs now, two flushing dogs. And I'm about now to start integrating um, this week, the challenge course. And what I'm going to do is 
These dogs are now very proficient at all the obstacles. And now I'm going to go up, 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 up to an obstacle, walking toward it quickly. But I'm going to now cue them to stop right before the obstacle. So they're going to be steady to the obstacle. Then I'm going to cue them with the neck to go on the obstacle. Then I'm going to cue them um, flank to either sit or whoa, stand on the obstacle and then cue them neck to go off the obstacle. So I like it as a secondary stage, but I, I still am a fan of the repetition of the woe post, the fact that you get away from them and you're you're just not right at them. Yeah. Creating that that degree of separation. Yep. You know, it's it, it's stuff that us as humans we don't fully recognize because we can logically reason. Uh, you know, we, we kind of infer that this can be done without me there, but some dogs, because they've been drilled and they've been done so many reps with you right by their side. And this was a challenge, especially when I was doing like the walking, uh, heel method when training woe when I first started is just building that degree of separation and that's built into the woe post. And that's why I thought it was, interesting when i've heard some people saying that it's completely replaced the post for them but that's also something that i'm interested in exploring more with them to figure out like you know if you're saying that it's replaced it i i want to i want to know more on that like i'm yeah. not i'm not saying that it hasn't or it, it doesn't work as well but i just i need a little bit more information on that yeah you know dog animals are very and we are too very contextual and so if all of your previous woe stuff was done um, at your side, right? Where you're right there. Let's say on the course, I wanted a dog to woe on an obstacle and I and I tried point of contact to get them to stop, but they ran to me and they ran to me and they ran to me. How am I going to get them to go there? The, the, the woe post enables you to have them that you're at a distance, so you're not right on top of them to get them to stand still. Um, particularly dogs that know how to bail out are the ones that really get a lot out of the low post um, because those dogs that can really bail out and there's some breeds that are more specific to bailing out than others. Um, you could run into a little bit of a meltdown of trying to teach them to be still while you're at a distance, you know, mm -hmm. you walk away and they want to be with you. So um, there's so many beautiful ways to train dogs. And and there's no wrong way or right way necessarily. And there's beautiful creative ways. And what works best for each person works best. You yeah. know? And, it, and what works best for the dog, which is most important. Absolutely. And, and I think on that note, we'll, we'll, we'll leave this discussion to be picked up later, but before, before I let you go, I think you need to plug your artistry of field. I know that's something that's kind of very recent, but uh, exciting stuff. So go ahead and tell everybody what's going on at artistry of field and, and kind of what even led you to starting something like this? Sure. Thank you so much. Yeah. So I started a company. We launched it in March this year. It's called artistry of field. And um, I've always felt like I've been an artist in the field from the time I was a little kid. Uh, literally, I do artwork. Um, but the artistry for me is the riding horses, boating, kayaking, fishing, hunting, um, everything I do a field that is it's so beautiful that I feel like I'm an artist when I'm doing it. I'm creative about it. I'm having the time of my life. Our tagline is passionately going further. And I came to this crossroads in my life of hitting 50 where having a, a kennel facility, which I, I love and it's going stronger than ever. Um, I, I wanted to pursue some different dreams. I wanted to um, go on adventure trips. I want to design gear that I feel is lacking, um, particularly in the women's market, because I still wear a lot of men's clothing for all my hardcore upland adventures. So um my uh, my company, Artistry of Field, is a curated um, sporting and outdoor uh, cultural experiences and gear company. Um, I was uh, had the beautiful opportunity last month to go to South Africa wing shooting. I shot um, six different species of South African upland birds, um, right. including the elusive gray wing Franklin. Um, it was an amazing trip. I have trips planned to Ireland, uh, Scotland, Iceland, Georgia. Um, and our our trips are very unique and boutique, small, um, uh, only about anywhere from 
three to four people for some of the small trips. Um, the first partners that we that we presented to and partnered up with with Holland and Holland. And so they're partnered with us and we're hosting an event at Pine Hill Plantation um, on uh, this November. Uh, we're hosting a women's event in Georgia this November and this is all on our website. But it's about me just wanting to go really further with my passions, hang out with really like-minded people who just live the sporting life, who want to fully encompass the sporting life. Um, we're doing an amazing dog element of it too, with some really fun, exciting things coming right down the pipeline. Um, and there's a huge give back element to it. Uh, working on um, partnerships with uh, Pheasants Forever, Quail Forever, um, Future with Ducks Unlimited and um, Ruffed Grouse Society. Um, and every, as we progress with this company, there's gonna be a big portion of giving back to um, to conservation and the environment because that's just it's what drives me yeah well yeah. i mean again to have bird dogs you have to have birds you know conservation is should be if, if you're getting into it to hunt you should be getting into it just just as much or as passionate about conservation as the hunting side of it because to yeah. me it's it's just one one full package there but yeah. that's awesome I, i'm i'm excited to see where you go with this and i'm excited to you know, just see what it turns into. And, and sounds like you're always looking for that next challenge and next oh, adventure. And, still for fun. Yeah. And, and I, I, I have a feeling this won't be the last time we check in with you on an episode, but Jen, I appreciate you coming on and sharing your, sure. your experience with the course and everything. If I can um, help anybody, um, our website is qkdogs.com. Um, my email address, jbroom at qkdogs. You can um, be happy and I'm sure I'm going to get inundated, but um I, I like to give back. I like to help people. I like to help your dogs. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, my kennel facility, we do full-time training, boarding. Uh, we, we're we we're getting into canine physical rehabilitation for post and pre-surgical care uh, at, at there. Um, we got a, got a beautiful facility and um, it hosts some really fun clinics and learning opportunities. So feel free to check us out and reach out because it's, uh, it's just a great, great um, it's a great venue and I absolutely love it. I'm super excited to, uh, to have this platform and to learn and train dogs. It's fabulous. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Well, listeners stay tuned for the outro, Jen. Thanks again for joining us and taking your time out of the day. I'll let you get out there and go horseback riding and, and go have some fun. And, uh, we'll, ch we'll chat soon. I'm sure. Awesome. Thank you so much. All right, everybody. I hope you enjoyed that episode with Jennifer Broom breaking down the obstacle course, confidence course, challenge course. Pick your pick your name uh, for it, whatever you whatever you think is best. This episode was presented by Standing Stone Supply, DT Systems, Onyx Hunt, Final Rise, and Upland Gun Company. If you listen to this episode and you're still asking yourself afterwards, what is what is really the benefit of a gun dog? owner or handler or trainer what is the benefit of this to where you're not doing agility or whatever to me like if if you if you're having trouble to really kind of piecing it together or making it work for what you care about which at the end of the day might be just hunting birds you, you have to kind of stop and ask yourself when when we're sitting here discussing and and considering everything that we do with our dogs and all of the principles and theories and concepts within dog training, the thing that spoke to me most about the obstacle course is it kind of incorporates everything that we are taught to care about in when it comes to training our own dogs. The the you know, I've had the benefit or the privilege to talk to so many different types of trainers that ascribe to different methods and, and terminology and everything. And so I try and focus on the common threads between each trainer more so than the differences. And, and there's so much that goes into the obstacle course that really hits on those common threads from trainer to trainer, regardless of which method or theory or concept they subscribe to. Because, you know, when you talk about everything from the importance of touch communication, uh, points of contact, it, the silent approach, body language, high repetition, attrition, it, like they're just teaching the dog to be 
you know, situationally aware of themselves physically as well as what's going on around them, what's being asked about them. You start incorporating distractions. You start increasing the level of difficulty. You ask them to focus. You ask them to stand duration. Everything that we talk about, you can incorporate into the workouts on the obstacle course. So when I've had a few people I've I've mentioned that I'm I was doing this episode with Jen and and a lot of people got excited about it because there is a growing popularity within this. A lot of people are starting to incorporate a lot of this stuff into their training regiment as well. You know, just in their backyard, it doesn't even have to be a fancy A frame or, or any of that stuff. As you heard on this, it's just obstacles, just putting it out there. But I'll, I did get some feedback from some people who like. That doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. I don't know what benefit that would have to me. Uh, you know, I'm a grouse hunter. How does that help me kill grouse? And at the end of the day, is it is it just makes a well-rounded dog, especially if it's a companion, if you live with them inside the house. And that's been the main, probably the main takeaway that I've had in the short time, as you guys heard on, on this episode, that I've dealt with training an obstacle course. You know, I don't have anything fancy. I do have a handful of obstacles out there, but just bringing it into my normal routine and my normal process with my dogs, I've already seen a lot of benefits and differences within my dog. I I feel like I am seeing my dogs able to focus more. Their self-release from certain things, whether it's a woe or place, is naturally getting more uh, it's naturally getting longer. It's the cooperation with inside the house, the respect that they show not only myself, but by extension, my wife and my daughter. And they they really haven't changed anything from a day to day perspective of living with the dogs other than just I have started incorporating stuff like the obstacle course within my training regiment. And at the end of the day, Jen kind of touched on this to where it's just fun. It's something different whether you whether you really buy into the the side benefits or the mental side or the focus of these dogs whether you buy into that or not some of this some of the training and day to day and small re, small just repetitive sessions over and over again it can start to wear on you as well as your dog. If you get bored with it, they can get bored with it. You have to bring a certain new level of energy. And this just changes things up. It gives you something different to do. Even if you don't incorporate this into your everyday routine, maybe just having a few obstacles there provides you with enough variety to where you can kind of keep things fresh and change it up. And, you know, I would just like to point out that again, if you don't, if you don't really buy into it, uh, that you don't really think that there's a direct relationship to the dog's mental side of things and the focus and the physical physiological benefits to it out into the field. If you don't buy into that as a hunter, just consider some of the people that are currently using it as well as the people in the past. Maybe that it wasn't a quote unquote obstacle course. But just the tables, the barrels, all of the tailgates, whatever, it's kind of been within the the dog world or or gun dog community anyway. It's just it seems like in recent years, it seems like every year it's getting more and more popular by by people such as Jen and Mark and Martha up, up, up at Webfoot. And a couple others that are starting to incorporate it. You know, there's a few other methods that are popping up, like, you know, the the method uh, by Jordan Wells and, and Sonny Picard. So that's kind of getting some uh, getting some relativity uh, within the space right now. And I know they're really big on this type of stuff is it, is it starts with a calm dog. It starts from the kennel. It starts on the chain gang. It starts on obstacles. And you're going to naturally see that cool, calm, collected, well-rounded dog, whether it's in the house or in those other locations, that is going to naturally transfer over into the hunting field. And again, if if for anything, just providing yourself with a little bit of variety uh, within your training routine, that goes a long way just for your mental makeup as well as your dog. So uh, I urge you, you know, wh- whether you go and construct a big 
obedience course. It doesn't have to be anything fancy. You know, go put some obstacles out and just just make it a consistent thing. Give it a shot. Try it out for a th- for a while. If you have an old uh, force fetch table or training table, just start incorporating stuff like that. You know, just add a piece of wood on the end of that. Make a little ramp and and get creative and and have some fun with it. I would be interested to hear your guys's response if you've guys seen any kind of noticeable differences within your dogs, especially in the short period of time. Um, again, it's a lot of fun. I, I just urge you to, to give it a shot, you know, don't knock it until you try it. I've, you know, I had my doubts the first time I was around it, but then I saw how everybody was having so much fun. And then I started seeing some of the benefits through the dog. So I've incorporated, uh, a bit of it myself. So take that for whatever it's worth. And, uh, yeah, with, with that being said, again, I hope you enjoyed the, the conversation and the topic. Jen is a wealth of, uh, information and I, I was glad to finally have her on. I, I look forward to exploring other topics and discussions with her in the future, maybe even checking out her uh, amazing operation over at Quinnabog. Uh, maybe check that out in person. And then uh, if you guys have any interest, but please check out her artistry of field. Sounds like she has some really cool stuff going on there and sounds like she just stays busy. There, there's always kind of something that she has her hands in, it seems like. So, uh, you know, I look forward to exploring more topics with her in the in the future. With that being said, I'm going to start wrapping this up after a little bit of housekeeping. If you if you enjoyed this episode, if you've enjoyed previous episodes and you find some sort of benefit or value from the information that that these trainers and guests are giving you on a week to week basis, then please consider joining Patreon at patreon.com forward slash gundog it yourself. It really helps out. I could not do this podcast or at least to the level uh, that it currently is, as well as to the level that I hope to uh, strive for without the the support of the Patreon patrons. And for their support, I do give back what I can in terms of Onyx membership giveaways, bonus content, such as the episodes with Nick Larson. Uh, there, there's a lot of different stuff that I'm, I'm toying around with on Patreon. I do do have another listener, Carson Fillin, who does custom leather work stuff. He actually offered up a couple of custom made pieces to incorporate in the Patreon giveaways over the next couple months. So if you're interested in seeing something like that or getting your name in the hat, so to speak, then by all means, check out patreon.com forward slash gundog yourself. If you are watching this on YouTube, just know that there's an entire catalog of 200 episodes on any other podcast streaming platform, be it Apple, uh, uh, Spotify, Stitcher, Podbean, iHeart, whatever. Just search Gundog it yourself, you'll find it. And then also, if you're listening to this on the regular audio output, this is this is another YouTube video. Uh, there's a lot of examples of the obstacles as well as the training concepts that Jen touched on within the episode. So if that appeals to you or you want to know a little bit more about what this looks like and some of the stuff she was describing, then please check out our YouTube. Again, just search Gundog yourself. And uh, this topic is perfectly fit for just reminding everybody that think outside the box. You know, you don't to train your dog and get your dog ready for hunting. It doesn't always mean three to five birds planted in the field. It doesn't always mean just roading in the physical uh, conditioning. Sometimes the mental side of things and getting creative matters just as much. So the main takeaway from all this is just get out and do something with your dog get creative enjoy it have fun because at the end of the day that's what this is all supposed to be about is enjoyment and having fun with our dogs with that being said thanks everybody for listening and hitting download please share with a friend and uh, we'll check back next week thanks guys